Robin Hood Radio and the Robin Hood Radio Network is proud to present Leonard Lopate at Large, lively hour-long in-depth discussions providing overviews and context to topics usually covered in partial measures. His guests include leading thinkers, scientists, artists, economists, farmers, historians, authors, and politicians. Mr. Lopate is a Peabody Award winner whose numerous honors include three Associated Press Awards and three James Beard Awards. Welcome to Leonard Lopate at Large. I'm Leonard Lopate. Two Jewish musicians from Russia were living in Berlin in the 1920s with their young family, but because they were facing difficulty finding safe havens in post-World War I Europe, they sought work with an orchestra in Tokyo, where their fourth son, Isaac Shapiro, was born in 1931. The family lived through the American firebombing of Tokyo, and after the war, Isaac became a U.S. Marine Corps translator and jeep driver at age 14. He tells the story of how he survived the war and eventually became an American citizen in a recently reissued memoir called Edelko, Edelko, uh, Growing Up a Stateless Foreigner in Wartime Japan. It's published by Seaside Press, and I'm very pleased it has brought Isaac Shapiro to our show now. Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. It's available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Of course. Isn't uh, this an updated and re-edited edition of the memoir? When was it first published? 19, I'm sorry, 2009. Oh, so it was still long after the events. Oh, yes. Um, and what led you to, to decide to write a memoir, You especially <laughs> since I'm sure you couldn't remember a lot of the details by then? Well, I waited till I w- was retired. I never had time <laughs> to write a memoir while I was working as a lawyer. Mm-hmm. I was working full-time, and for 15 years I was a adjunct professor, so I was well-occupied and had very little time to do anything else. And I always deci- I had decided that when I, once I retired, I would start writing the memoir. Do you still have the diary you shared with your brother in 1942? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I'm sure you consult you. Uh, well, actually, I, st- I stopped writing in it, so I, I didn't continue to use it. Now, Edo was the name of Tokyo before it became the country's capital in 1868. Why did you choose to call your member Edoko? Because a child of Edo, someone born in Tokyo, is called in Japanese Edoko. Hmm. Ko is a child. So Edoko is a child of Edo. So there's no Tokyo Ko? No. No. If you're born in Tokyo, you're an Edo- Edoko and uh, take pride in that title. You are the third generation of Shapiro's to live in Asia. Why did your maternal grandfather move to Harbin in northeast China? He escaped from Odessa with his wife and my mother, who was then four months old in 1905, after a very uh, <clears throat> bad pogrom which killed thousands of Jews. And Harbin was uh, starting to flourish as a railroad center, and he went to work for the railroad. So was that a, a typical thing? Because most, uh, as far as I understood, most people went in the other direction, went into Europe, and if they could, came to the United States or went to Palestine? No, Harbin was a favorite destination. It was a small town of 30,000 people, but there were a number of Russian Jews living there already in 1905, having gone there late in the 19th century, and uh, he knew someone who had left, and so he decided to go to Harbin and go to work for the railroad there. What had your mother's life been like when she was growing up in China? It was... A wonderful life. She went to a very elite Russian girls' school, Ganarozova, it was called, and she graduated uh, at the very top of her class and was enrolled at the Berlin Conservatory of Music. As Harbin, at that, at that point in time, didn't have the musical education facilities, and Berlin was the musical capital of the world. Is that where she met your father, Constantine? That's Zubero? where she met my father. In they were both professional in musicians. In 1925, 
and within three weeks they were married. <laughs> was it becoming difficult for Jews to live in Germany in the 1920s, even before Hitler came to power? I wouldn't say it was difficult enough so that they took refuge elsewhere until the early 30s. In the 20s, there was enough political unrest as it was without anti-Semitism. And then, of course, Hitler came to power in 33, and that's when the anti-Semitic movement began in, in earnest. But they also went to Palestine before they went to Asia. They went to Palestine. Zionism was a uh, movement then, and lots of European Jews emigrated to Palestine, which was then a British mandate. And my father went to work for the Tel Aviv Symphony, but they didn't pay salaries. The musicians divided the proceeds from the ticket sales, and that wasn't... <laughs> so a, it was a real struggle. A, a, and a, very, a very good source of income. And there was a good job waiting for him in, or your parents in Tokyo? Uh, n no, or? they went to Harbin first, where my grandfather still lived, and my mother was then pregnant with her third child. Her first children were twins, so at the age of 23 in 1928, uh, with pregnant with her third child, she said, I want to go home to my father. And so they went to Harbin, where her third child was born, my older brother, and then uh, my father got a job in Tokyo. So he, they went in late 1930, I think it was, from Harbin to Tokyo, where my father uh, had a job. And uh, I was born in January 1931 in Tokyo. Weren't there Jews living in Japan as far back as the 16th century? I don't know about that. The first movement I know about was in the late 19th century. There were Jews in China all the way back to the 10th century. And in India as well. In India as well, correct. But I think the Japanese Jewish population started in earnest in the late 19th century and early 20th. Did many Japanese still remember and appreciate Jacob Schiff, the Jewish New York City banker who helped fund the Russo-Japanese War in 1904? I suppose they did, but I, ne I never heard of him until I came to America. I wonder, if it, is that the New York Post Schiff's as well, Dorothy Schiff's father or grandfather? I'm not sure. Uh, but the largest Jewish population in Japan was in Kobe. Why That's Kobe? That's correct. Big port, and uh, they started a community there. Were you observant Jews? We were observant to the extent we could be. There was no synagogue. So you, you couldn't be bar mitzvah? I was not bar mitzvah. Uh, I was circumcised <laughs> when I was born. That was not a problem. Were you mostly friends with Japanese children, or were there a lot of other foreigners there as well? Um, both. We lived in a Japanese neighborhood, and we had friends, neighborhood friends, and we were sent to the British school, the Yokohama International School, so... We, we developed friendships with our schoolmates who were British, American, Russian. And that's where you learned to speak English. That's where I learned. Which was an important part of the story. Yes. Uh, you, but you, the family then was in Yokoha Yokohama. Yokohama, that's right. Uh, that's the largest port in Japan. Yes. Why Yokohama? Was there a, a place for musicians in Yokohama? No, but it was a relatively inexpensive place to live. We lived right by the ocean, by the sea, uh, in a Japanese house. So it was ch cheaper to live in a Japanese house than a Western-style house. And uh, we, had, we, had, we had beds. We didn't sleep on the floor like the Japanese, but uh, we had tatami and uh, sliding doors, mm -hmm. uh, everything that goes with a Japanese house. Were you speaking Japanese? We sp were you but we had a servant who was Japanese, so we spoke Japanese to her. She didn't speak any. Otherwise, Russian and then... Russian at home, yes. And English at school. And English at school. My father was very strict about that because pretty soon my brothers and I spoke English to each other, 
and my father would get very upset about that. Because it was a secret language. <laughs> That's right. You were excluding him. Were you doing that on purpose? It was, it was easier because <laughs> we were living in, living in English during the day uh -huh. at school. All our friends spoke English, and it was much easier for us to communicate with each other in English. You wound up speaking fluently, th three languages fluently. Uh, French was one of my early... Oh, French too. Yes, languages. Was yeah. Western classical music popular in Japan at very, that time? Very, very popular. The first symphony orchestra was uh, created in the t 1920s. Did you learn to play a musical instrument? We all studied piano. Because mm -hmm. your parents were teachers as well as... They were teachers. Performers. Yes, and... Uh, made really made their living principally through teaching now what was your source of news in japan were you reading the japanese newspapers were there, were there was an there english was no language television. newspaper called the japan advertiser which we read regularly because we couldn't read japanese and japanese is one of the hardest languages in the world to <laughs> read because yes it's a combination of <laughs> of, of a couple of Chinese sources and then Japanese sources on top of that. Yes, after the war, they limited the number of Chinese characters to 1,800, I think, to make it easier for the Japanese to read and write. Because the, the Chinese don't have a phonetic alphabet, so they have to learn thousands of characters. The Koreans worked it out by creating an alphabet Re using uh, yes. the, the Chinese characters as their Correct. basic source. I think they have... 30 characters. Something like that. I never learned Korean. <laughs> but there's also, isn't there also a Japanese, uh, a, an aspect to Japanese language that has the equivalent of a, an alphabet? Oh, yes, there's a, uh, there is. There are two alphabets, this katakana the, and hiragana. That must have been really complicated for a kid. Very complicated. Um, were you aware of how Hitler Germany was treating Jews back? Uh, yes, we were, from? because there were, Jewish refugees that came from Germany regularly. And in fact, uh, in the late 1930s, my father used to translate for them at the American consulate because a lot of those refugees came through Japan and uh, wanted to go to America, North and South America. And so they couldn't speak English and my father could speak to them in German or Russian, and he would take them to the consulate and interpret for them. And he also spoke some Japanese, I assume. Oh, yes, yes. He, spoke, he, he taught in Japanese. He taught at a Japanese school. After Pearl Harbor, did you root for the Western Allies or the Axis powers? My, my, my diary, which I didn't bring, would show you that we were rooting for the West. Allies, and hoping that they would win the war. So when Japan became allied with Germany, would, did that feel like a betrayal? We weren't happy about it, but the Japanese treated us reasonably well, and uh, in a civilized way. And because my parents were musicians, they were respected, and the fact that my mother had five sons was a uh, useful <laughs> thing to to experience. The the five sons all went in different directions. I don't want to get ahead of the story yes. after the war, but does that mean that you weren't as close as I might have imagined? I thought about that the other day. It's curious that although I was very close to particularly my older brother, who's still alive. Not the twins. Not the twins, no. The twins were gone. The twins went to Harbin in 1944 and survived there. And um, in the meantime, my mother's father died, and they were on their own at the war's end when the Soviets occupied Harbin. And that's how come my oldest, the oldest of the twins, went to Soviet Russia and became a Soviet. In fact, uh, the, the the brothers wound up after the war in you, you in the United States, another brother in Israel, uh, other in Russia. <laughs> in fact, w the three of us served in 
three different armed forces at the same time during the Korean War. My guess is Isaac Shapiro, known to uh, all of his friends as Ike. Uh, His memoir is Edoko, Growing Up, a Stateless Foreigner in Wartime Japan, published by Seaside Press. You're listening to Leonard Lopate at Large here on WBAI 99.5 FM in New York. What was it like living in Tokyo when the Japanese uh, bombed Pearl Harbor? Well, we we were still in Yokohama Mm -hmm. when the uh, Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and the war started. I remember going to school and seeing Japanese neighbors crowded around radio sets saying, oh my God, the war started. And they were not at all uh, excited about it. Although, from what I've read in in Japanese literature, uh, the militarization of Japan in the late 30s into the 40s was quite obvious to anybody, even if they were just trying to live a normal life and and not have anything to do with the military. Yes, it was. There were parades, there were uh, military material uh, going through the streets. Absolutely. So was there a feeling, we, well, we, want, we want to go to war? Not people in the neighborhood. Our neighbors were not at all happy about the war. And uh, You're talking about your Japanese neighbors? Japanese or? neighbors, and their, their sons were all conscripted. And so our neighborhood associations, which had to do with distribution of food and so on, were run by women, mm-hmm. some of them former geishas, very tough women. Very capable. Now, th- that was what a, a former geisha could do in st- for a respectable job? Oh, yes. They, but there were still geishas in Japan at that time. Oh, there were. But when they had uh, ended their careers because they weren't young enough to be geishas anymore, they took up uh, other jobs and were very capable. As non-Japanese, did things change for your family when the war began? Uh, only to the extent of being subjected to uh, police oversight and uh, having to live with food rationing and rationing of all kinds of products. Differently than, uh, different from Japanese people? No, the same. Mm -hmm. We were subject to the same rules and uh, of distribution of food. There were some special things which foreigners uh, enjoyed which the Japanese didn't. Uh, We had special uh, sugar rations and other foods that the Japanese were not interested in. And uh, also, since my parents didn't drink, we would trade our sake and beer rations for normal food Mm -hmm. because nobody in our uh, family drank alcohol. Now, your subtitle is Growing Up a Stateless Foreigner in Wartime Japan. Why weren't you considered Russian citizens? Because my father had lost his Russian citizenship at the time of the revolution and my grandfather, my mother's father had lost his. For a while, my father had what they called a Nansen passport, which was... uh, issued by the League of Nations, I believe. But he had no passport, no citizenship. I'd assume that there were lots of people in that situation. Oh, a great, great number of people. Because the Soviets said, if you want to have Soviet citizenship, you have to return to Russia. They didn't want to return. and my uh, Had they left in the first place to escape yes, communism? Yes, my, my father's parents left and in fact moved to Japan right after the revolution. My father's father's father was a banker and the bank had branches in Asia and they got out with my father's younger sister and spent three years in Japan from 1918 to 21 and then eventually moved to Paris where my uh, father's sister grew up and and created a French family four or five generations. But no matter where you went, <laughs> eventually things got dangerous. It wasn't good to be Jewish no. in France when during the no, occupation. No, that's right. Uh, 
was being a stateless foreigner actually an advantage? If you were English or American, might you have been uh, interned? St- yes, You've been the British and Americans were interned, and uh, we were not because we had no nationality. And you were still able to. Your uh, parents were able to perform. Yes, and uh, the so the Soviets entered the war in the last week of the war in August of forty-five, and so the Japanese didn't really have time to decide how to treat ex-Russians, whether they should be treated as enemies or not. Well, there had already been a war between Japan and Russia, hadn't there? The Russo... Oh, that's at the beginning of the 20th century, yes. But they weren't at war with each other. That was pre-communist Russia. Yes, exactly. The Soviet Union didn't declare war until a week before the war ended. Now, while the official propaganda stated that every Japanese citizen was ready to die for the emperor... Didn't you know many <laughs> who were trying to avoid military service? Yes, indeed. And some of them succeeded and uh, weren't conscripted, and others were. So did uh, any of your friends or neighbors join the military? Uh, yes, indeed. And were you seeing much anti-American propaganda? A lot. Hmm. Oh, yes, almost daily. This is in before Pearl Harbor or a- only after Pearl no, Harbor? No, after Pearl Harbor. How did you, 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 well, you mentioned that your family survived partly because you had uh, food rations, rations. Yes. But um, we're talking about a family of seven. Eight, because we had a governess who was a member of our family. She had joined my mother in Palestine and uh, stayed until... They moved to California, and she died there. So we were eight, family of eight. Yeah, that's. it must have been difficult under any circumstances. It was. Indeed it was. And then in 1944, the Japanese military evacuated the coastline. He, well, it was... It was that's not, where you were living, Yokohama. Yes. It was not the military. It was the Japanese c- civilian government mm-hmm. that came and told us we had to move out. They found us a house in Tokyo... They came and packed us and paid for the uh, moving costs and were very, uh, very decent. Were you happy in Tokyo? This is the capital city. Oh, yes, we loved it. It was a major world capital. We were. And and you you were happy with the the apartment or the house that you were living in? We had a Western style house for the first time and uh, it was a very well situated house in the central part of Tokyo. And then we were enrolled in uh, Waseda University's international school uh, where they taught Japanese to returning Japanese from overseas whose children had been in foreign schools and didn't know their own language to the extent that (laughs) their fellow citizens did. And that school closed down once the bombings began. So during 1944, the fall of 44 into the spring of 45, when the bombings were quite intense, the school closed down and we just we were out of school altogether. Before and during the bombings, to what extent were you able to keep a normal routine? Uh, did you do the things that uh, people your age might have done, Japanese people, like going to Kabuki theater? Yes. My mother took, I remember my mother taking us to the Kabuki theater. Did you feel a connection to it? I loved this it. could grow so I much out it. of Japanese, uh, the Japanese ancient culture. Oh, I became very fascinated with it and, and I'm still very <laughs> much turned on by it. And were your parents still able to connect with fellow musicians and work as musicians? Yes, indeed. There were quite a number of uh, refugee musicians from Europe, German Jews, Russian Jews, some non-Jews too, but uh, most of the musicians were Jews. And were there Japanese classical Western musicians? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And uh, what, what were the favorite composers? Uh, 
favorite composers. I would imagine Bach would be very popular yes. in Japan just because of the nature of his music. And um, the Ueno, Ueno Academy of Music was the principal academy there, and they had some foreign teachers. Uh, I would say it's all the same composers that you would expect to be popular elsewhere, classical. Bach, Beethoven, uh, Schubert, Chopin, Schumann, and so on. And then there were Japanese composers who were composing in the Western style. Yes, but very few. Really? So, very few. so there was this big gap between Japanese music, which at this point was, uh, because I've listened to some of the, the uh, march music, for example, marching music from the time, they were using Western in instruments. They were using Western brass. Um, marching bands weren't using samisen. <laughs> but if you dig into the history of, of music recording, which began very early in the 20th century, Columbia Records was very prominent in Japan, and uh, all the classical recordings were of Western music. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are now CDs which were used or really made from the old recordings. The old vinyl? Yes. Well, actually, and before vinyl, wasn't it the 78s? I can't remember. 78s, that's no, right. They were wax or something. Yeah. And I have some of those CDs of the old uh, classical recordings, and it's, it's, it's all the composers you would expect to be recorded, mm -hmm. the ones that I've mentioned. And how, what, how is the quality? Excellent. Columbia Records uh, enjoyed uh, real success. Mm -hmm. So the, Columbia was bringing in Western music, but it was also recording Japanese musicians. Yes, indeed. Now, then we come to the, uh, the firebombing. What was it like to live in Tokyo when the American air raids started on a, on a regular basis? <laughs> that was very frightening. <laughs> Are you amazed that you survived because so many people died? Yes. Tokyo <coughs> suffered probably as many dead altogether as were killed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki during the atomic bombings. In fact, uh, the, in, in one case, uh, well, uh, there, there were many people who, five million people were homeless after those, yes. those raids. And I have photographs in my book of Tokyo after the raids, showing devastation. How, how frequent were the bombings? I initially, they were not too frequent. When the, Al the Americans were occupying the Mariana Islands, and it took them a while to establish bases from which they could send B-29s, they would send single bombers. Uh, and that wasn't as frightening. And in fact, we had an early raid in 1942, the Doolittle raid, so mm -hmm. to speak, General Doolittle. Jimmy Doolittle. Yeah, B-25s. And they came and raided Tokyo and Yokohama and then flew over to China. And how much destruction were you able to witness? Did your parents let you out of the house? Well, we were out of the house because the fire engines ran out of gasoline, and we had pumps, mm -hmm. and we were required to go out on the street and pump uh, water to put out fires. So although we, we had an opportunity to hide underground, most of the time we came out and tried to help put out the fires. You say hide underground. There were air raid shelters. Yes. There were basements of buildings. Uh, were any members of your family injured? No. I'm speaking with Isaac Shapiro. Uh, we're talking about his book, Edoko, Growing Up in uh, as a st Stateless Foreigner in Wartime Japan. It's published by Seaside Press. Uh, he will be appearing at the Strand Bookstore at 828 Broadway tonight uh, uh, at 7 p.m.
uh, just a few days before the anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima on August 6th. And we'll get to Hiroshima in a few moments. But uh, let's talk a bit about the still the bombings on Tokyo. General Curtis LeMay led the combat operations yes. against Japan. Yes. And he changed the way things were done. Yes, he he designed the strategy of uh, flying bombers at a low altitude, two to 3,000 feet, which they'd never done before, and using fire bombs rather than uh, regular explosive bombs. So the fire bombs were much more destructive, especially in Japan where so many of the buildings were made of wood. That's right. And I don't know what percentage of Tokyo was demolished by fires, but it was a very large uh, percentage of the territory. And in fact, the total who total number of people who died from LeMay's bombings exceeded the totals in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. There was one uh, raid, the single most destructive bombing raid in human history, that... March 10th, uh, 1945. Were you in Tokyo at the time? I was indeed. Despite your father's warming, didn't you sneak out of your house at night to witness the bombing? Indeed. With your own eyes? We all did, and we manned the pumps and... What did you see? Just yeah, fire, fire everywhere? Fire, fire, fire. Americans called it Operation Meeting House. That's right. Why Operation Meeting House? I don't know. I never found out. But the Japanese called it the Night of the Black Snow. There, there was snow at, on the ground at the time? N not that I remember. Uh, close to 100,000 people died that That's one right. night. Over half a million f total from all the bombings. And 5 million people became homeless. And that was the one, one raid during which I lost a friend who was killed. A boy, Russian boy. How close did the fires come to where you were living? Right, all around our neighborhood. We had to fight fight the fires to stop them from burning down our house. Curtis LeMay said that had the United States lost the war, he fully expected to be tried for war crimes. I never heard that. <laughs> and then later he was involved in the bombing of Vietnam, also controversial. Yes, that's right. Now, by 1945, when this was happening, was it clear that Japan was losing the war? Absolutely. Nobody had any doubt. But the, the, the press was censored. Yes. What were you, were, were they reporting on all of the, uh, the military defeats? They weren't, but f friends of ours who had radios were able to get news that we weren't able to. My parents never had a radio or a telephone. They also downplayed the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. That's correct. The only reference to it that I saw was a one-paragraph article in the Japanese press saying that a new kind of bomb had been dropped. You would have thought they would have made a big thing of it because uh, the, uh, most countries would be screaming, this is a, a crime against humanity. Well, they were afraid to... Uh, propagate that information because they didn't want the Japanese population to become so frightened that they were going to be they should have been. as they should have been because it had the war not ended and had they uh, dropped atomic bombs on all the major cities uh, there'd be nothing left of Japan. No, the, the Japanese fact, emperor... This famous song that the Americans sang was there'll be nothing left but vultures to inhabit all that land when our bombers and ships and something make a graveyard of, graveyard of Japan. Ooh. Ooh. I, I learned those songs during the occupation afterwards because the uh, American soldiers would sing them even though the war was over. Now, the, the emperor was revered. Um, did you ever see him? Not then. I, I, I met him in the 1970s when I was president of Japan Society and the emperor uh, had my chairman, John Rockefeller, and me to dinner. In fact, I think you were there, Jackie, too. One of somebody who's in the studio with us. Um, but uh, you, you were the, the head of the Japan Society for how long? In, for seven years, in, from 1970 
to 77. And that's when I first met the emperor. Do you remember when you heard that he had announced the surrender? I listened to it on the radio. It's in my book. Uh, it was the first time, in fact, I think the only time that he broadcast, that he broadcast, and everybody, everybody listened. No, so nobody had heard his voice. Until nobody had heard his voice before. And they played the national anthem, and then he appeared. I mean, he went on the radio and announced the termination of the war. Although there were members of the government who wanted to continue the fighting. Yes, there, there were several meetings which the em over which the emperor presided, and he broke the the... What, the dispute, he resolved the dispute by ordering the end of the war. Didn't you run away from home to watch the, the landing of the Allies? I did. I, I sneaked away, yes. But what did you tell your parents? You I said I was going to the country to buy food. <laughs> your first contact with the U.S. military was with an Army officer. Why did he approach you? I was sitting on the on the wharf in Yokohama across from the New Grand Hotel, watching the boats come with American troops, and he saw me, and he thought I might be able to speak English, which I did. And did you realize how valuable you could be speaking both English and Japanese and being familiar with a number of Japanese cities? N not particularly, but <laughs> I very quickly learned that I could play a valuable role, and, and uh, I was hired. He took you to lunch at the officers' mess, and that was the first Captain time. Kelly, actually. He, that was the first time you ate Spam. I'm yes. <laughs> that must have been an eye-opener. <laughs> he offered you a job with the U.S. Army as an interpreter, but didn't you get another job offer that same day? Not that same day, but mm. I was picked up by some naval officers as I was headed to the station to take the train home, and they stopped me and asked me to uh, guide them around. And and they gave you steak and ice cream instead of Spam. They took me aboard their <laughs> ship, uh -huh. an LST, and gave me, that's right. So uh, the, you, you decided to go with them instead of the people with the Spam. Uh, I, I thought the Navy was <laughs> more generous. <laughs> you were a teenager. How old were the American officers you were working with? Um, in their 20s and early 30s. And what was your first impression of these Americans? Well, they were, uh, I couldn't have been friendlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was impressed with the fact that they, uh, they became friendly immediately. I mean, there, there was no formality about it. You were also, uh, in a way, seeing a place that you were very familiar with through foreign eyes. Because I, I'm sure that they talked about what their reactions to things that you already knew. Yes, of course. They were, it was all very new to them. And they couldn't find their way around and they couldn't speak the language. And so I became a kind of bridge. On VJ Day, September 2nd, Emperor Hirohito surrendered to General mm -hmm. MacArthur aboard the USS Missouri. Uh, well, he, did, he didn't go to the... Oh, he didn't go to the... the surrender ceremony, no. Shigemitsu, the foreign minister, mm -hmm. actually signed the article of surrender. And I was on the USS Iowa next door. So you were one of the rare <laughs> Japanese, or whatever we want to call you, who to actually witness Witnessed the ceremony, yes. And uh, they, they flew the same flag that had been flown when Commodore Perry entered Tokyo Bay That's in 1854. Right. Or 53, whatever. Uh, did you sympathize with how humiliating that must have been to the Japanese? Well, I understood their feelings of humility, but I, I wasn't particularly sympathetic to them, no. Can you tell us about uh, Colonel Toby Munn? Yes. Um, when, when the LST, where I was first received by the naval officers, left Tokyo Harbor, uh, I was turned over to uh, a Navy captain who would occupy the airfield there temporarily. And then Marine Air Group 31, 
came up from Okinawa, headed by Toby Munn, and they were the permanent occupants of the Okoska Air Base. He was from a small town in Arkansas. Why do you think the two of you bonded immediately? <laughs> Especially since you were, what, 14 years old at I, the time? I was 14. He was childless, and he was from uh, Prescott, Arkansas, and mm-hmm. had gone to the Naval Academy. Uh, and he gave you the, your nickname, Ike, which stayed with you for the rest of your life? Yes. <laughs> How did uh, he and his fellow officers treat you? Wonderfully. But then you it made me him into a mascot. <laughs> but then you had to introduce him to your parents. I finally introduced him to my parents. Yes. Was that uncomfortable? Not really. They they were in a sort of permanent state of shock and didn't respond in a normal fashion to anything. And when he came and said he wanted. To in the spring of 45, that he wanted to bring me to America, uh, they were very acquiescent. Besides translating, you also learned to drive a Jeep at the age of 14. I did. And one of your duties as an interpreter was to accompany groups of young Marine officers to geisha houses. Correct. Was that a strange experience for a 14-year-old kid? Very strange. (laughs) Is that when you came to know the actor Tyrone Power? Yes, what were the circumstances of that? Well, he was a pilot, and he was a transport pilot. And he would ferry um, personnel from Okinawa to Yokosuka. And he lived in the same junior officer's quarters. that I, He was a first lieutenant. And we messed together. We ate our meals together. And what, did you know he was really famous? Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. I'd seen his movies and. I was very uh, uh, impressed by him. You also had the opportunity to visit Hiroshima with a group of Navy officers. In October of 45, yes. How how long after the the bomb? Two months. So it it must have looked totally devastated. Completely. Completely. Uh, But not in the same way that uh, Tokyo had had looked after the firebombing? No, because there were no buildings standing except the building in the center of the city. Colonel Munn wanted you to come to the United States with him. What reason did he give? He just thought that I had no future remaining in Japan, and he was offering me a a chance to create a different life. Your father said that under the U.S. occupation, he, he lost all control of his That's children. Right. That's so right. Did, did he try to dissuade you from leaving? N- not at all. Now, after the war, so how long after did you leave? I left in July of 45. So I was already, I'm sorry, July of 46. Mm-hmm. I was already 15. I landed in Hawaii July 12th, 1946. Were you there during the uh, when Douglas MacArthur uh, oversaw the occupation of Japan? Yes. Um, it was done very differently than the occupation of Germany. What do you think? Well, they didn't want really to allow any of the Allies to have a uh, authority, and it's particularly the Soviets. And so MacArthur did not share his oversight power with any of the allies. How how did the Japanese people view MacArthur? Uh, They were in awe of him, (laughs) and especially when they saw a photograph of him next to the emperor, and he was two heads taller. (laughs) But he exempted Emperor Hirohito from responsibility. Uh, Was it necessary for him to make General... Hideki Tojo, the Japanese wartime, prime minister, the villain? I think he chose to do that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, he uh, might have undermined the too much of the Japanese. Right, the occupation would go more smoothly if he recognized the emperor's authority. He he certainly didn't have to recognize Tojo's authority. Uh, Looking back, are, are you surprised by some of the things that you were able to witness as a kid. You attended some sessions of the war crimes trial. Yes, I did. Well, life life was just 
completely unpredictable, shall we say. And whatever happened, happened, and you took it in your stride and uh, witnessed it, experienced it, but you weren't really overly influenced. Well, what impact did uh, all of this have on the Japanese view of the war and their own reconciliation with the past? It was a very complicated process because you had returning uh, military personnel returning to their families mostly ashamed and embarrassed about the defeat and um, ignorant as to what was going to happen to them, what was going to happen to Japan, would, how would Japan survive the occupation. Happily, uh, they survived it quite well. And transformed Japan to yes, some degree. Agreed. When you went back to Japan years later, yes. were you surprised by how much it had changed? Not surprised, but uh, very... Conscious of how much it had changed. I'm speaking with Isaac Shapiro. His <laughs> memoir, Edoko, Growing Up a Stateless Foreigner in Wartime Japan, is published by Seaside Press. This is WBAI 99.5 FM in New York. Um, can you tell us about your adjustment to living in two very different parts of the United States? You, you first went to Hawaii. Y yes. And then you came to New York City. Yes. But, uh, there were two completely different experiences. This is before Hawaii was even a state. So you were stateless in Hawaii as well as stateless yeah, in Japan. Yes, and Hawaii still has an Asian population of about two-thirds, I think, uh, of Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and now Vietnamese origin. Uh, my wife and I were there recently. I, I went back for my 70th high school reunion in June of this year, and I was struck by the fact that there was this large, non-English speaking Vietnamese population. You get in a taxi, and the driver is Vietnamese, doesn't speak any English. Mm. <laughs> and I don't speak Vietnamese. So it was quite a shock. When I first went to Hawaii, everybody spoke English. Uh, and there wasn't a Vietnamese population. Did you immediately start feeling like you were an American because you'd been spending so much time with Americans by that point? Well, it was a very comfortable atmosphere because so, so many of the people were Asian, and I was used to that. Uh, it was it was a friendly atmosphere, and uh, when I got to New York, it was a completely different experience. New York was was not by any means Asian. It had a, a lot of different communities, both here in Brooklyn and in Manhattan. Chinatown and so on, but it was not anything like Hawaii in that the people were didn't seem to be assimilated. They lived in separate communities. We also had uh, uh, immigration laws that prevented people from Asia coming here until much yeah. later. Yes. What brought you to New York? I, I was actually a quota immigrant and assigned to the Asia Pacific quota because I was born in Japan and it was by day, place of birth that you were classified and um, at that time the quota was a hundred uh, people a year that all just only a hundred people only a hundred people from the entire Asia Pacific Triangle and you came here to go to school uh, I came originally to Washington where Toby Munn lived and I moved in with him and uh, then was enrolled at Columbia College. And in July of 48, uh, I went to New York and started my New York experience. And your parents moved to California. In 1952, after the peace treaty between Japan and America, they were able to uh, come to the United States. They were. They were uh, also quota immigrants, but they were on the Russian quota mm -hmm. because both of them were born in Russia. Meanwhile, your family, as we mentioned earlier, totally dispersed. Yeah. Um, yes. Two of your brothers uh, 
served in armed forces of different countries. Yes, and then the, you were in the U.S. military. One was in the Israeli, and another one was in the, in in the Russian. Russian. Yes, and my uh, the third son, my older brother Jacob, who uh, is still alive, stayed in Japan after my parents left. And he married a Japanese. And he woman. married a Japanese. So. Woman. <laughs> totally dispersed family. Now, how did you come to be the president of the Japan Society in, in the 1970s? I was <laughs> I was already uh, a lawyer by that time. I'd become a member of the New York Bar. Was working for the law firm of Milbank Tweed, an old American law firm, and. Uh, John D. Rockefeller III had revived the Japan Society, which was founded in 1907, but was dormant during the war, moribund. And he he wanted to create an organization, a not-for-profit organization dealing with Japan. And he was told there's this Japan Society which you can revive. So he brought it back to life. And I considered it an invaluable resource at the time because it was a, an opportunity to see some art I couldn't have seen anywhere else and True. many Japanese films. That's right. That's right. You, you showed films that uh, just were not shown in the theaters. If well, you anyone was interested yeah. in Ozu or Kurosawa, well, uh, they wound up at the Japan Society. Rockefeller had participated as a naval officer in the peace treaty negotiations with Japan. So that, that's the source of his interest. And he brought life to the Japan Society in 1952. And uh, Milbank Tweed was a traditional law firm for the Rockefeller family. And <laughs> curiously, the wife of one of my associates at the firm was his secretary. And so when he th revived the society, she said to him, you know, my husband works at Milbank Tweed and there's a young um, man born in Japan who could be useful to you. He speaks English, too. Yes. So he called me and, and made me the secretary of the society. And then you met Hirohito. That must have been and an overwhelming we, experience. It was. He came to New York on an official visit. And I have a beautiful photograph in my office of myself greeting him. Japan House. Now you worked for law firms that also had offices in Japan, so didn't you work at times in Japan? Yes, in 1977 Milbank Tweed opened an office in Tokyo and my wife and I and my two daughters went there for two years. How was your Japanese by that time? It was quite good. <laughs> <laughs> good enough. Now, you, I mentioned earlier your memoir was recently updated and reissued. Um, why did it need updating? Uh, it, I changed things in the epilogue to reflect things that had happened mm. since the first publication. Uh, the death of two or three people mentioned in the epilogue. And, and, and now the, the new emperor is about to leave. And the, the new sun. emperor is abdicating next year. And... This is th this story is the kind of story they make movies out of. Has anybody <laughs> talked to you about making a film? Uh, n no, our, my agent, and I think Chris Kelly, are reaching out to film producers, but so far nobody has stepped to the plate. <laughs> well, it's a fascinating story, and I, I thank you so much for being on our show today. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, that does it for this week's show. Modern Lopate and Large comes to you on Saturdays at 4 and Tuesdays at noon. You can subscribe to Leonard Lopate at Large podcast on iTunes and by clicking on Robin Hood Radio's archive program site, which is robinhoodradio.com. You can also check out Leonard Lopate at Large Facebook page. We hope to see you next week. Thank you.